I'd like to welcome you guys to Unit 7. This is our first uh, unit covering evolution, and our theme for this unit is going to be differential reproductive success. Just like in earlier units, we talked about uh, differential gene expression. Um, this is going to be the key idea that Darwin has for um, how we get the origin of species and how species evolve. So, pretty uh, controversial subject for some people in terms of uh, its implications. Uh, however, the uh, the basic theory behind it, the basic ideas behind it, are very obvious kinds of things. So um, Darwin's basic summary is, is pretty much straight up here. Um, you have organization organisms vary um, in their characteristics. And uh, the other thing is that there's more organisms born than ever survive to reproduce. Um, based on those observations, uh, if population sizes remain steady, uh, what you're going to see is that uh, the organisms that are best suited for their environment are going to be more likely to have offspring that survive, and they're going to have more offspring that survive. And as a result of that, we're going to have favorable traits accumulating in the population. Now, one of the um, primary mechanisms for that, of course, is natural selection, but it's not the only, and even Darwin said that himself, that it was not the only way that you could get evolution to occur. Um, he was just kind of concerned that his theory would be important enough uh, to be a major contributor to evolution. So we'll talk right now about his theory, and uh, you've probably heard about the, the finches uh, in the Galapagos Islands, and uh, here's a couple of different examples of finches, and uh, you can see from this graph that the average finch beak size for different species uh, is going to vary, and uh, that is going to be something which is going to change over time, which is exactly what Darwin said, uh, that that selection could be directional, um, and it could also be based on environmental effects. In this case, uh, uh, incidents of drought um, were documented in the incidences of drought uh, correlated very well with changes in beak size. So um, natural selection is a major mechanism for evolution, uh, and Darwin is the guy who came up with that. So it's not uh, not going to be one of those things where you're going to have people to fight with what the observations are. Uh, the implications for that is where people have issue in. Uh, we'll, really, we'll talk about that a little bit, but it's really not a major focus of this course. Now, um, where did you get the variation that started with? And we've already covered this pretty well. Um, we had mutations, uh, uh, changes in DNA. Those mutations can be caused by lots of stuff we've already talked about, you know, uh, radiation and um, chemicals, um, you know, just basic mistakes in copying. Uh, and uh, so you have mutations that are going to cause uh, DNA to change. And uh, those mutations can uh, sometimes have uh, no effect at all. In fact, most times mutations have no effect at all. They're non-coding regions of the, uh, of the DNA, of the chromosome, uh, and they have no effect on it. Uh, sometimes they make an organism less likely to survive, and uh, those obviously are selected against, and those uh, organisms typically don't survive for very long. And then occasionally mutations are going to make your organism more likely to survive. And uh, so mutations are going to be creating some of the genetic variation that evolution or natural selection is going to work on. And the other way that we're going to get uh, the variation created, of course, is through sexual, sexual reproduction. And uh, any organisms that reproduce sexually, like these little piglets over here, um, will uh, create variation, slight differences between individuals. So they all look pretty similar, but if you looked at something simply like their ear size or the length of the whiskers or the length of their, uh, their forelimbs or their hind limbs, uh, you would see variation there. And that variation is what natural selection is going to work on. And just like it says, it's going to be selecting. And in this case, it's going to be selecting for variants that are, that are best, best fit. Now, the uh, stability of the environment also affects the rate of evolution. And uh, we can see here um, that according to uh, Gould and Eldridge, uh, that the stability of the environment um, is going to, uh, um, the, the more stable the environment is, typically the slower evolutionary processes are going to be. So what you see here is that when the environment is rapidly changing, that's when you also see evolution of species. And the reason for that, of course, is that when the environment is stable, um, there's really no selection pressure for anything different than what we already have. But when the environment is non-stable and there's changes, maybe increases in temperature, decreases in particular kinds of vegetation, uh, or you know, increases in uh, um, you know, acidity level um, of, of the water, uh, if that is changing, then organisms either have to, uh, um, they're going to need to adapt or die. And uh, so the adaptations that they have are going to be the thing that's going to allow them to, uh, to survive and to pass it on to those children. And so therefore we get a rapid change. So evolution is not a continuous process like uh, Darwin envisioned it as, 
gradual process, but typically it's going to kind of go in spurts, um, you know, uh, rapidly changing and not changing at all. All right, so uh, there are also some random processes um, that are going to affect evolution, and uh, one of those random processes is what's called genetic drift. And you can kind of see from this, uh, if we look at these blue and yellow as representing alleles in a population, it's approximately equal numbers of the blue and yellow in the bottle. But when you try to pour the, uh, uh, the balls out of there, mid say marbles, out of here, uh, what happens is that uh, uh, they don't come out in the same proportion that they exist in here. And so the surviving individuals, for whatever reason, maybe we had a drought or something like that, and so some survived, uh, but some didn't, uh, the population or proportion of alleles in this population here is different than the initial population. And then as a result of that, then the uh, number of blue becomes more represented in the uh, population than the, uh, the number of yellow, right? So that's a bottleneck effect that happens for lots of reasons. Um, you may have heard the, about cheetahs. They're the fastest uh, um, land mammals on Earth and uh, among the fastest organisms on anywhere. And uh, they suffered through a population bottleneck um, in the fairly recent past. And so although the cheetah population sizes are uh, large enough to sustain um, for a long period of time, their genetic diversity is so small that they are highly inbred uh, and very high risk of uh, extinction as a result of the fact that they have a limited amount of uh, uh, alleles to, to work with. So if there's evolutionary change for some reason or environmental change for some reason, um, they don't have the same kind of uh, genetic makeup that they had before the bottleneck in order to be able to survive that change or have the raw material to survive that change. So very likely our friends the cheetahs are, uh, um, I hate to say it, but marked for extinction. So that's a, a random process. Genetic drift can happen for lots of reasons. Right? And uh, we can actually measure um, what that, uh, um, well, the, the rate at which that could happen. Um, so we can say, you know, hey, is this population here evolving or is it not evolving? And uh, um, Hardy and Weinberg came up with this. We're going to spend a lot of time with Hardy and Weinberg. And we talked about just some very simple mathematics with this. Uh, in fact, uh, the mathematics on this are so simple that uh, most of the time, if you have to use a calculator, uh, to calculate your Hardy and Weinberg equilibrium numbers, you've probably done something wrong. So, but here are the basic principles. Um, no evolution is going to occur if there aren't any mutations, so that would create no genetic change for us to work on, or evolution to work on. Uh, organisms rated, mated randomly, and that, that, that doesn't happen. Uh, and then, of course, no natural selection. That, that can happen depending on the situation. Uh, and you have a very large population size, that's very common, you know, especially something like bacteria, it's very easy to have them population size, and then no gene flow, and that's simply uh, immigration, you know, uh, or, or emigration organisms moving in or out of the environment, okay? So now one um, characteristic which typically is in Hardy-Weinberg um, equilibrium is what we've talked about before, PKU. And uh, remember that PKU is a, um, a defective enzyme. Uh, uh, people are in, unable to um, to digest large amounts of phenylalanine, and as a result of that, the enzyme doesn't work, the phenylalanine is not broken down, it builds up as a toxic byproduct, and those can have very severe phenotypic effects. Um, and they can also cause death if, you, if you're not diagnosed. Uh, anyway, um, the PKU is one of those things which is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. The proportion of people in the population who have PKU uh, has remained fairly stable over time. So even though um, generally Hardy-Weinberg uh, is not going to be met, uh, there are particular characteristics for which it is met. So uh, Hardy-Weinberg is good for measuring rates of evolution. So we can look at populations over time and see um, how much evolution has occurred. We can actually quantify it. All right, so we talked about this before, but natural selection acts on phenotypic variation of population. Uh, and you have very likely heard of um, your superbugs. Uh, and this is an example of what's called antibiotic resistance, and you can see here that uh, one organism, one bacteria, is trying to share with another bacteria um, a code of DNA that's going to turn it into a superbug. And that's kind of what happens with antibiotic uh, resistance. And uh, we talked earlier about uh, horizontal gene transfer, and you can see here uh, that that process is working. Some of the bacteria um, are resistant, some are non-resistant. Uh, when exposed to the uh, um, uh, drug, um, some of the non-resistant ones are going to pick up from the resistant ones the, uh, 
the resistance, the, uh, the, the plasmid or the DNA that can contain the gene that allows them to survive um, uh, when exposed to that antibiotic. And what happens is over time, we start out with a population that has resistant and non-resistant, but over time we create uh, these drug-resistant bacteria. So the more we use antibiotic, or particular antibiotic, the more likely we are to create that antibiotic resistance. And the same thing happens in insects. Um, you know, if we are spraying DDT on a field, which is a uh, um, pesticide, um, it's going to be really, really, really effective. In this case, 95% effective. Um, but the five who survive, or five in this case that uh, did not get killed by it, uh, they are going to survive and reproduce, and each generation, their uh, proportion within the population is going to increase. And so you see that uh, um, insecticide resistance um, is very similar to the, uh, the bacterial resistance, although um, in bacteria it's horizontal, and in these guys it's vertical. It's passed on through generations. It's not like uh, the DDT made them um, resistant. They either were resistant or they weren't resistant. And it's just that we are selecting for the resistant ones. So every time we use a chemical to kill organisms, we're actually selecting for survival the ones we really want to kill. So that's kind of the, uh, the bad thing about natural selection if we're talking about controlling insects or bacteria. Uh, in a good way, though, of course, you know, you yourself are the result of phenotypic variation in the population. You are the accumulation of all of these traits which have been successfully passed on. Uh, so, you know, the opposable thumb, uh, you know, uh, even the crazy stuff like mid digital hair, which you wouldn't think would have any effect at all, uh, that might have it, you know, the earlobe. Is it uh, free or attached? Uh, those are all uh, um, can be the result of uh, phenotypic variation, uh, and they can be selected for. And maybe uh, uh, maybe all kinds of things that you can think of that be selected for in a population. Well, if we look at uh, any uh, currently existing species, uh, they have lots and lots of adaptations selected for the environment that they're in. Uh, now, of course, the bad thing is if the environment changes, then uh, you know what made them successful before might no longer may no longer make them successful, like we saw with. Something like the dinosaurs, or you know, some kind of rapid eco uh, ecologic change uh, causes very fit organisms uh, if for one environment not to be fit in the next, and we see a rapid die off. All right, and then of course genetic drift can also be uh, uh, representing um, stuff that just happens randomly again. And uh, you know, so if you look in this example, um, the alleles are 70% and 30% in the initial generation. Uh, and then in the second generation, 50-50, and the third generation, 100 and 0. So some random event, maybe, you know, in this particular garden, um, only the deer that came through uh, only ate the pink and white ones. And so only the red ones survived. Uh, and so as a result of that, the allele frequency for, for no, um, well, in that case, that would be the particular reason. But uh, let's say that for some reason where they were planted or, uh, you know, the amount of soil they got there or something like that, just some random event. Um, you ran over them with a mower. You didn't select anything particular. You just happened to run over them. Uh, one group and not the other. Uh, you change the population numbers. So you can control how many uh, organisms are in your yard based on where you mow and where you don't mow. So if you check in my backyard, you're going to see there's places I don't mow, and there's lots of things there that are growing. Basically, I'm selecting against the one by mowing, and I'm selecting for the ones by, by not mowing. They get to grow faster and longer. Okay, so we have lots and lots of stuff that is uh, supported. This is stuff that you guys have seen in your previous courses in 7th and ninth grade, possibly earlier than that. But, um, and, and a lot of times we talk about this as what's called evidence for evolution, and it's really not evidence for evolution. Basically, it is what evolution predicts would happen. Uh, and these are, uh, um, this, is, this, is, this is things that evolution can explain. So one of the uh, coolest ones for me is something called biogeography. And you can kind of see with biogeography, that the um, organism here, the initial species A, um, we have a geologic event which separates these two um, islands. And then next thing we know, there's new uh, ecologic conditions on the second island, and the population evolves into B. And then we have other events, and we see some speciation events occurring. And here we have a new mountain range. So uh, um, C, a population C is actually uh, separated by the mountain range. They can't cross over, and so new populations evolve uh, that end up being new species. Uh, and then we, uh, uh, we kind of recolonize over here. So biogeography is a spread of species um, over uh, uh, time and space. So uh, one of the things that Darwin's uh, theory can explain is biogeography. And 
So that one's a pretty handy, handy one for us to, uh, to look at. Um, and so basically, if you looked at organisms that lived in one part of the world, so um, let's look at the fossil record over here. Um, and uh, we see, uh, actually, let's look at the fossil record. We'll, we'll skip on that. that but if you take this guy right here and you look at them, pull it down, come on, baby, there we go. And uh, got those guys attached. So in the fossil record, what we see is that we have particular kinds of organisms that exist for very long periods of time. And then we have other organisms, like, say, humans, that have existed for very short periods of time. In the fossil record, um, which is uh, time, basically it's a measure of time, um, we are going to see these guys um, basically uh, change over time. We can see changes that are mapped out in the fossil record. Not everything seems saved in the fossil record, uh, so it's not a perfect method, um, but it does allow us to see fossils of organisms. And what we see is that the farther up we get, the more close to recent in the rock, the more similar the organisms are in the rock uh, preserved to the currently existing organisms. And so uh, fossil record. So um, Darwin's theory can explain biogeography, biogeography, the spread of currently existing organisms um, over the Earth, and it can, uh, which is uh, space, you know, distance, and it can also explain um, the history of the Earth. So very powerful. Now, of course, plate tectonics had a lot to do with that, and so we see uh, um, that playing a role as well. And it keeps fading on me, so we won't talk about that right now. But of course, as the uh, um, as continents drifted, uh, organisms started on one continent may end up on, uh, on other continents. So uh, one of the big ones we see is uh, what, we, what we find in uh, South America and in Africa. Um, their coastlines match up very well, and so uh, um, organisms like uh, primates were kind of divided. They existed in both Africa and South America, and then as Africa um, and South America drifted apart, uh, we see what are called old world monkeys, which are, uh, you know, apes uh, would be an example of that, um, without tails, and new world monkeys, uh, you know, um, that you would see that have tails. And so we have lots of stuff there that's uh, um, explained by the theory of plate tectonics. All right, another one you've heard of, small structures. And all of these structures are pretty simple uh, to understand that we have four limbs of organisms that share what's called common ancestry. Uh, then they're going to have their own patterns and genetic uh, uh, shapes that are very similar to the So if you look here, uh, the humerus, which is green, uh, uh, all those is, is, is always in the same location. Again, that's the upper part right there. And then the lower floor, which will also refer to the upper part, lower floor, is going to have two bones. And after the ceiling sweep here, this here unit is going to be purple. In each of different examples, stuff that you uh, have, you have your wrist or any other things. So the patterns of the details, even though the shapes appear different, the patterns of bones are the same, you're in the same position. Do you want to spend some extra time? That's what we call all the structures. And again, that shows up with your common ancestry. Right, uh, another Costs. example of biogeography, so we'll start it. we look at these uh, first, um, lizards in this case uh, right here. Uh, knowledge uh, ideas that see that they results in different they gene are, expression, um, and that leads to cell specialization. So very similar to each other. Uh, gene some are divided in uh, by two uh, examples uh, for you, very simple examples. Uh, uh, color and, and uh, some shape and basic patterns, patterns on them. Um, they're all very closely related are transcribed together, and they come from a common ancestor of proteins. And based on the environment that they're in, here. And the uh, predators that they may be exposed to, they're going to be coded with the different uh, enzymes. And so I can go lead in, so I may see these guys uh, uh, have their ages uh, to digest lectins. And finally, of course, uh, uh, more modern uh, sugar that's from uh, uh, DNA, so you could give uh, bacteria uh, to the or create and lactose as an energy source. What are called uh, uh, the one we have over here is phylogenetic uh, trees. Trip opera on it, and the is you see the acids, these species which are most um, similar to each other, supposedly making them the DNA turkey Thanksgiving to be common quickly the case. So the more similar you see again, the more similar there are five different. We can do the same thing with proteins. So we use DNA evidence and protein evidence to uh, carrying uh, out species, uh, synthesis or building so, uh, all of these things can be by bioessential or it can help so us explain or expand, expand about about evolution on uh, and, and it does still fit it's very well with the protein it's actually around the DNA and it blocks our things all right so some other evidence that we see for evolution has to be with very simple kinds of things present in bind down the process you can do cell structures as you see here i'm sure you guys have seen the dna cell sequence since we studied cells already or the amino acids and then have those proteins. Like no membrane systems, uh, 
cytoskeleton, the membrane bound organelles, and all these things are shared in common by all eukaryotic organisms. And as a result of that, we say in eukaryotic organisms share common ancestors, even though you have nothing like a yeast. And so that means if you look at a yeast cell and synthesis, it's all these lots and lots of structures. So any one of your cells actually, there would be lots and lots of structures that we can see that would allow us to compare the two different kinds of cells. And we would expect that cells from you and cells from a panda would be more similar to each other than cells between you and the yeast. And then we also have, let's get back to this idea of conserved or processes. We talked about that quite a bit here. But you know, like we see the same that's going to be breaking down uh, anaerobically Our, sugar yeah, uh, carry to provide energy. Uh, but it's a little more all organisms are uh, going to carry out like all the uh, All organisms have uh, uh, the proteins capable of carrying out yeah, electron transport uh, inside the mitochondria and the chloroplast. Particular gene, Krebs cycle again inside the mitochondria. Probably not really is a process of GNC. And of course, the calorie cycle and the light reaction gene itself shared among all plants and it's right here among the terminator. And it actually has these two of our uh, uh, protists, which carry out in the exons of the protists. You'll see, you'll see those guys on protein, right? And of course, we have a constant translated transcribed. And uh, this is uh, irregardless of species, uh, you know, from the bacteria all the way to uh, so the DNA uh, complex one of them, you see, because they all share the same genetic code. Outside all the codes, we have these all these uh, sequences of uh, the first one is a uh, mRNA, uh, the three codon sequences of mRNA, UTA, be uh, coding. This is where the things are composed. So this is started. Yeah. So any kind of transcription. Um, lots of stuff that suggests are beyond the transcriptions. It's very good. We're going to have these uh, near control why, elements. Uh, these and we're going to have these process control elements. elements. Very these are segments of DNA. And, uh, segments that is why, again, they're widely distributed. Have. And, uh, of course, we also expect transcription that that's the case. Proteins. Uh, if somebody so had to the new way to do this integration, which we find to and we're efficient. Um, that that would be passed on. So uh, and DNA the would has the coding segments and non coding segments. Um, lots of stuff here in the gene. Well, remember the gene codes for a protein. For a protein. Pretty much you're not all the segments with the, uh, the DNA. The all right, so one of the uh, techniques we're going to use in class, which is going to be relative to the class, is called the class. And then we're going to have a promoter tree, and then we're going to have uh, You guys have probably seen something like this. This particular one is bind to great apes. Protein, uh, of course, great apes themselves uh, end up with the homicides. Um, and the hominids themselves have their own phylogenetic tree that is based on what's called DNA. Right. Yeah. So then we also so take this baby uh, right here and explain of that communication that's going to some of the cell evidence outside the cell, which is going to affect gene expression. Pop out here. A good example yeah. is uh, the protein called the tumor. Here's the phylogenetic tree. And then here is the DNA. Possibly evidence. These are sequences in the DNA associated with that cancer. Up. Uh, and, and you can see this tree. Uh, Preferences between uh, organisms. Cancer is and we can see based on those different pieces of how three genes are cancers. And we have this group of cancers called BLAST. And you can use that program. So let me just simply figure out the relationship between UV radiation and something. We have over here, we have the UV radiation. Effects of UV radiation is because this one is the DNA showing you what happens. That is going to cause an intracellular evolution of our chemical message to go to activate organisms. Three communicates, which are P53, is going to help compare the DNA, or it's going to cause the transcription of proteins in the cell. And you can see here that it causes some dyes to begin with. And then we have many ideas that are more complex to chamber. So that's a pretty simple example. P53 is you get the modern pair of the DNA. So the mammals, which are four chambers, cause the cell itself to All these have a relationship to each other. They're all there to pump blood. So now I care that's the function of UV radiation. The complex it is, the damaging agents can be things like x rays that you can even survive. And we can see based on data, so it looked at the DNA sequences and even in this couple of replicas. Uh, for anything, and there's going to be basically a fairly good phylogenetic um, tree. How they slow down in the cell cycle? Yeah, and, and, uh, uh, a tree, of course, uh, has is something which is uh, what's tested. Apoptosis, uh, or that's we'll think about this. Cells it has the tree uh, that's a is uh, uh, provided. So we generate this one right here. We can see Gales gets additional data. Um, we can could come up with a new phylogenetic tree that can be changed pretty easily. So you can structure them and you can change them based on your information. So you see in this particular one, uh, we have a new species of human that's called Australia, I think it's Sediba, 
uh, which was relatively recently discovered, and uh, they have developed a biogenic tree to, uh, to uh, account for it. So it would not have been there in the past. And you might think that it's just the science is capable of being cancer based on the data. And if you look at these simple example, diagrams are very far. Those tumor suppressor genes, if you look at how species are related to each other, and to an eye, compare the degree to which they are. That's going to happen to it. So you're going to use a lot of diagrams and more study how they work closer to this cancer. Or we use simple examples, complex examples, and use their mutation program called BLAST. Right. So that is it. Remember that our theme for this unit is differential or suppression of success as it was in a fail to the environment so it becomes more likely to uh, survive and life test than those that are in some cancerous cells form, uh, but very few of them will form tumors because they typically do it in an isolated fashion. And we other, have other control mechanisms that are going to keep them from uh, becoming cancerous. So don't think because you go out today uh, and get lots of sun that you're going to get uh, cancer from it uh, and die. That's, that just doesn't happen. Right. Another thing that we have are called uh, homeobox genes, and these guys are super cool. Uh, and these basically are um, a shared set of genes that are found in all animals. And it doesn't matter what kind of animal it is. I mean, if you look, uh, we're pretty far away from a fruit fly, um, and yet we share lots of genes in common with a fruit fly. And many of the genes that we share in common have to do with a body plan. And you can see that the order of these genes, based on color, is going to uh, determine um, location of different body parts. So this little red part you see right here, you see right up there. Now what is different between the Drosophila and us has to do with the fact that we are going to have these gene duplications. When they may have one copy of the gene, we may have two. They may have one, we may have four duplications of it. And that is going to give us a, uh, the differences in our body plan. But the genes themselves are the same. So if you're looking at this, you're like, okay, how can we possibly look at a fruit fly? Well, the reality is that uh, um, the control mechanisms for the same gene expression uh, is going to be the thing that matters, how the, how the gene is expressed, where and when. All right, so now this is something you have heard before. Uh, changes in genotype result in changes in phenotype. And uh, the phenotype, of course, is your physical characteristic. You learned that in mental earlier this year, and you also learned that, of course, in your other, other classes we learned about mental. And we know that most of the changes in genotype um, are the result of uh, genetic um, mutations. So uh, mutations, again, are changes in DNA sequences. They can happen at the gene level. They can happen at the chromosome level. I put up for you here three different mutations uh, that are at the chromosome level. And this first one over here is called polyploidy. Let me pull that baby up and resize it for you. And polyploidy is going to be uh, um, where two different uh, plants, two different plant species, um, are going to uh, have the pollen from one uh, fertilize the egg of the other. And uh, when the sperm fertilizes the egg in there, it produces a hybrid. And instead of having the same number of chromosomes, they may have twice as many chromosomes. You may find this hard to believe, but uh, we have uh, 20, 23 pairs of chromosomes in humans. And uh, corn, something we eat, you know, almost everything we have has corn in it. Um, actually has 112 total chromosomes, 56 pairs, and that's a result of polyploidy. And polyploidy can cause something called hybrid vigor. So you see here that the hybrid between these two species is going to be uh, uh, growing much more rapidly, producing larger flowers uh, than either one of the initial sea, um, species did. So hybrid vigor is a positive kind of mutation as a result of uh, polyploidy. Uh, we can't really do polyploidy in, uh, in animals. Um, Typically, when chromosome numbers are wrong, you're supposed to have two uh, of each uh, form of a chromosome, uh, then we're going to get an organism that doesn't develop. On occasion, we get some that do. And two examples of those, you've probably heard of Down syndrome. And in Down syndrome, we have a uh, situation where we have um, an extra uh, chromosome, in this case, an extra chromosome 21. Down syndrome can uh, result from other mutations, other chromosome mutations, but the most common one is carrying an extra chromosome 21. We also have another one called Turner syndrome, and you've probably heard about this one as well. And in Turner syndrome, we're actually, we only have one X chromosome, and we do not have a Y chromosome, so instead of having, or another X chromosome, so instead of having 46 chromosomes, we only have 45. So this one is called trisomy because we have three, and this one over here is called monosomy, so we can, uh, we only have one um, in a pair. And whereas polyploidy is another one. The mutations are creating genetic variations. So some very simple ones that you already know, like deletions and duplications and insertions, 
and then some other more complex ones like we see here. So changes in genotype do result in changes in phenotype. And another example of that, that differential gene expression and genotype is what's called heterozygous advantage. Um, and in this case right here, we have um, sickle cell anemia. And sickle cell anemia causes uh, um, blood cells to have uh, inappropriately shaped hemoglobin molecules. And those uh, exposed to low oxygen cause some hemoglobin, cause the um, red blood cells to sickle, and hence the name. So they're not sickled all the time, they're not all sickled, but um, what you get is you get people who are uh, uh, in, in places uh, in the world uh, where we have uh, exposure to malaria. Um, the sickle cell apparently is not susceptible to getting infected by the uh, malaria parasite. And so people who are normal, um, they are going to, uh, they're going to die. Uh, if they get exposed to malaria, they, can, they have a higher rate of death. And those who have the sickle cell themselves are also going to die because the sickle cells are going to cause um, tissue and organ failure. And the people who are heterozygotes are the ones that are more likely to survive and reproduce, survive and reproduce because they're less likely to get infected by malaria and they're less likely to be affected by the sickle cell itself. So if you look in places in the world where they have lots and lots of malaria, like the pink shaded over here, uh, we're going to see um, in those areas high levels of the uh, frequency of the sickle cell heterozygotes. And just like with hybrid vigor, um, these guys are going to be, um, these people are going to be more likely to survive and reproduce. When they have children, some of their children will be normal, some will have a sickle cell, but then about 50% of them will have a uh, they'll be uh, heterozygotes. Uh, another example of differential gene expression uh, that's going to cause, in this case, heterozygote advantage. All right, well, we also have um, many different ways in which we can decrease genetic variation, besides for mutations. Uh, in prokaryotes, which is you don't know very well, um, they have lots of different ways to do what's called horizontal gene transfer. That's within the same generation. And basically what happens whenever a bacteria dies, it releases uh, both its chromosomes, or its chromosome, its single chromosome, and it also is going to uh, um, release what are called plasmids. Plasmids are uh, right down here. Um, and when plasmids get released, the plasmids themselves are just small rings of DNA that contain codes or code for one or more genes, typically one, one or two genes. And so if you have a uh, transformation, when this cell dies, its DNA is exposed, this one picks it up and gets incorporated in there. So that's horizontal, just same generation. And then down here, we have plasmid transfer between two. So let's say this is an antibiotic resistance uh, um, uh, plasmid. It's containing some kind of a, a protein that causes the coat of the bacteria to become uh, more complex. And that keeps the antibiotic from getting to the uh, bacteria. Um, that is going to be uh, called conjugation. We can transfer those between. And then the third way that we can do it is because this virus picks up a piece of DNA from the bacteria. When it erupts from the bacteria, it infects the other bacteria. Um, that's called transduction. And it's going to be transferring not only its DNA, but also the DNA of its, um, of its former host. And so that is a horizontal gene transfer, which happens in prokaryotes, uh, transformation, transduction, conjugation. And uh, some of our more familiar to you guys are the things that we see in uh, um, eukaryotes, and that includes uh, meiosis. And in meiosis, we have a couple of things going on. Um, we know that uh, during the lining up during the metaphase plate, that the chromosomes kind of line up randomly. And as a result of them lining up randomly, uh, you can pick up chromosomes uh, uh, from mom or dad, but not both. And then sometimes during prophase before they go through meiosis, sometimes there's this process of crossing over which occurs. And the crossing over is going to be exchanging genetic material between homologous chromosomes. Homologous chromosomes, uh, let's say the orange came from dad and the uh, purple, pink, whatever that is, uh, chartreuse, maybe moth, uh, that is going to be coming from mom. So this chromosome from dad, this chromosome from mom, crossing over occurs, and now we have one normal chromosome here, and then we have one recombinated, recombined, one normal over here, and one recombined. So half are normal, like this is a dad, uh, straight from your dad, this is boom, straight from your mom, this one's a mix from uh, mostly mom and a little bit of dad, this is mostly dad and a little bit of mom. So that uh, is going to create some variations that we didn't have before, that's crossing over. Not necessarily a mutation, but it is a change in a DNA sequence, and of course, uh, random fertilization. We release millions of sperm. 
Um, when uh, fertilization takes place, a few dozen of those might uh, make it to the egg, uh, but only one's going to make it to the egg. We're not sure which one makes it to the egg and what their particular combination of traits is. Uh, so those are all going to increase genetic variation that we see um, in eukaryotes. So we can either have horizontal gene transfer or what we see in uh, eukaryotes, which is kind of more of a vertical between generations gene transfer. Right. Viruses themselves uh, cause a lot of problems, you know, they can cause you to get sick. Um, we can create new viruses. You've probably heard of uh, you know, new forms of viruses. Um, and uh, they can, like we saw in the previous thing, in transduction. Um, they can uh, uh, take it from one to another. And, uh, in this particular example, we have two different cycles. We have a uh, lysogenic cycle in which a uh, uh, bacteria is infected by a, um, a virus. And you can see that the virus itself gets its um, DNA incorporated into the host every time it divides. And after that, uh, it is going to be um, containing the whole viral DNA. So if you see any bacteria species that have been affected by viruses, all the succeeding organisms within that uh, group are going to have uh, the virus in them. So that's a lysogenic cycle, and that can be um, the virus can get itself transferred between generations that way. And then sometimes, more commonly, what happens is a lytic cycle, and that's where the virus infects a bacteria, takes over the machinery of the bacteria, and then causes new bacteria, uh, new viruses to be formed, and then those basically burst out of the bacteria. The bacteria dies, the virus goes to infect other things. So, lytic is uh, L Y L Y T or L Y S. Um, that's typically going to be something where you're going to get a breakdown or a killing. Um, so, the lytic cycle is going to kill the infected host, and the lysogenic cycle is a little bit more moderate. It's just going to pass it on between generations. Now, this other really cool thing happens, and uh, I'll tell you the story about DNA, um, uh, HIV, and its evolution. And uh, what we see here is a pretty simple example is sometimes cells can be infected by more than one virus. And uh, this is probably what happened with HIV. Is it uh, um, a primate along the, uh, um, somewhere in Africa um, got infected with one virus? Uh, and then got infected with the second virus, and those viruses ended up in the same cell, and when they replicated, they accidentally got incorporated into the same uh, viral code, and then they themselves started infecting other cells and created a new, um, a new virus. Um, so you can see that uh, we've heard of avian viruses coming from uh, um, uh, birds, uh, and we've got swine flu viruses that are coming from pigs, uh, and then we have influenza viruses that uh, are you know, present in humans, and those viruses can get intermingled uh, and create new viral combinations, some of which, like uh, SARS, or uh, you know, uh, the influenza outbreak that happened in uh, the Spanish flu in 1919-1920, um, are examples of new viral um, combinations that result from multiple viruses infecting the same cell. So they can both uh, create their own genetic variation, and they can introduce uh, genetic variation into their, into their, into their hosts. So here's a basic example of viral replication. This is kind of a common thing. You are going to need to know this. I popped it on here for you. Um, just kind of looking through this, uh, you know, how the virus tricks um, the cell into taking it up. Once it takes it up, it, takes, uh, it replicates. Once it replicates, then it uh, uses the machinery of the cell, the protein-making machinery of the cell, uh, to transcribe RNA, mRNA into uh, proteins. Then the proteins themselves go assemble the new viruses, and uh, then the replication of the uh, DNA itself is incorporated into that and get the, the new baby viruses. This would be a, a basic lytic um, cycle. And every time you get a, an influenza virus, or every time you get an upper respiratory infection that's viral in nature, this is exactly what's happening in your cells. So just uh, pay attention to that. Just kind of make sure you're familiar with the process. All right, so um, when we go to the bodies exhibit, Usually, uh, and one of the things that's fascinating to me uh, is how we get from a single fertilized embryo, like we see here, into the specialized tissue that make you now. Um, and again, you see it at the body's exhibit. Uh, and that is basically because of chemical signals outside the cell, uh, the makeup of the um, fluid that surrounds the cell, and again, our uh, uh, gene expression. Uh, which is going to cause cells to become kind of move from undifferentiated, like we see in this picture here, the preceding the uh, fertilized embryo to a 16, 32 cell stage, um, into what's called a blastula, which is again all undifferentiated tissue. Um, and then as it forms uh, the, the particular tissue for the particular organism, 
this case right here, we have uh, a tunicate. And uh, you can see here the different parts of the embryo have been injected with dye. So we can see where the dye ends up. And they end up in different tissue within, within the organism. So chemical signals from outside, gene expression inside, differential gene expression inside, can result in unspecialized cells becoming specialized cells. And we'll go over the mechanics of this a little bit more in class. Um, we won't spend a ton of time on uh, how they become specialized, but uh, we do want to understand that the uh, chemical signals are uh, mostly what's causing that, along with uh, differential regulated genes.